So I'm Steve Croft, and it's great to be here today with Andrea Young, uh, winner of the New Horizons Prize in Physics for 2018. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we'd like to learn a little bit more about you, where you grew up, what was your background? Oh, okay. I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, I went to Columbia University as an undergraduate and did my Ph.D. there also. Um, then I sort of ping-ponged around a few places, and now I'm at University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, how did you first get interested in physics? In physics, uh, both my parents were biologists and are biologists, and uh, I think as a child I wanted to do something different, but being a firstborn child, maybe I wasn't so creative, so physics was as far as that this apple was willing to fall from the tree. Mm -hmm. But it's something that's always uh, fascinated you? Since before I can remember. Yeah. Um, so tell us, uh, what is condensed matter physics? So condensed matter physics, broadly speaking, is, is uh, this is probably not a unique definition, but uh, I'll give you my idea of what condensed matter physics is and what's interesting about it. It's generally the study of the physics of many things put together, uh, hence condensed matter. So when you have many particles and they interact with each other, uh, what, um, what kind of collective behavior they can uh, they can evidence, and so that includes you know most of the materials that you see around you, but it also can includes quite abstract notions of what is matter, and uh, that's sort of the direction that my interests lie. Tell us a little bit more about your research. So my research involves uh, it's, I'm an experimentalist, which I think is a little bit unusual for this uh, for this prize, but um, the uh, our research is to make low dimensional electronic materials. So um, the laws of physics, in a sense, are different in three dimensions versus two dimensions or one dimensions or higher dimensions. And uh, it's very hard to make a six-dimensional universe, but actually making a two-dimensional universe is not so terribly difficult because we live in some higher number of dimensions and we can certainly confine uh, particles to a very thin sheet. So um, most of my research has been working on the thinnest of these sheets, which is graphene, which is just a single atom. Uh, thick sheet of carbon atoms, and in particular the, the physics of electrons within this sheet and how they interact with each other and what kind of, uh, what kind of states of matter they can, uh, they can fall into or they can, they can be described by. And how does this material behave differently to the matter that we're more familiar with? Well, so the, you know, the simplest, uh, well, I don't know how simple it is, but one of the, um, one of the kind of counterintuitive uh, properties is that we think about you know electrons as having mass so you know it takes some finite amount of energy to push an electron from rest right and and and, uh, and that's what true of you know the same way it's true of a ball that you hold um, the uh, but in graphene through kind of some magic of, of how the the electrons uh, interact with the carbon atoms the 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 electron in a sense sort of combines with the carbon atoms is described as though it had no mass at all um, and no matter you know, how much energy it has, it always moves at the same speed, just like a photon. Uh, and uh, that's a kind of remarkable fact that electrons in a sheet of graphene behave as though they have no mass. Uh, and there are you know, even more exotic things that can happen in, in two dimensions. You can have electrons that completely lose their, they, by their mutual interaction, completely lose their electronness and behave like a completely different type of particle um, with different quantum statistics and different, uh, different basic fundamental properties. Um, and so sort of everything is different. Uh, and what we do is try to find signatures in the lab for these things, you know, things that are really clear. And one of the, one of the sort of elegant um, and, and dramatic aspects of condensed matter physics is that when these things are true, they, uh, they often have rather spectacular effects. You don't have to do a tremendous amount of interpretation of some very weak signature. It's the physics of a, of a material. You might have a, a block of, of this stuff that, that behaves in this uh, strange way. And you know, occasionally that's useful, but often it's certainly, uh, it's certainly spectacular. And do you have practical applications in mind, or are you just kind of exploring? It's never been my attraction. Uh, <laughs> my, you know, my attraction to condensed matter physics, although certainly some of what drives condensed matter physics is... Uh, is that these things can be useful, and, and you never know what's going to be useful or not, not going to be useful. But um, rather, it's that, that condensed matter physics gives you a kind of laboratory for, for understanding um, 
how real some physical theories are. You know, so you can have this idea of a massless electron, and that it might be perfectly sensible on paper, but you know, it's hard to actually find a massless electron. But then you study graphene, and there you have them. You can play games with them, and you can see how real that idea is. Um, there are many kinds of uh, there are approaches to understanding our universe that that ask the question of what is our universe, um, and there uh, and there are right answers and there are wrong answers. Sometimes you have an answer. And it's logically consistent, but um, uh, it doesn't happen to describe, say, you know, the universe we happen to inhabit. Um, condensed matter tends to actually have a somewhat different approach because, in in a sense, an optimist might say that if you have some logically consistent theory of physics in some particular, you know, let's say, in two dimensions, uh, that might just mean be the physics of a material that you have yet to create, perhaps, or some detailed manipulation of a material that that you might already have. Um, and so, in a sense, you can actually go after some relatively deep theoretical concepts of what matter can be um, by playing around in the lab, which is what I actually like to do. So, uh, so, so that's, I think, uh, what drew me to condensed matter physics was this, this idea that, that you can look in an experiment pretty directly often um, at, at some really fundamental idea um, that uh, that could otherwise be just an idea. And what makes this physics rather than chemistry what you're doing? Um, well, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, to some degree, it's the company you keep. Uh, I think it's actually easier for me to explain what we do um, to a physicist than to a chemist. And in fact, what we're doing is very unchemical. I mean, the chemical formula of the material that I study almost exclusively is C. So that's not actually very interesting to a chemist. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the physics that uh, we're looking for, we're, we're trying to answer questions like, um, you know, in, in, in our normal universe, all elementary particles are uh, described by either being fermions, so that's, you know, electrons, protons, or bosons, that's photons, you know, helium atoms. Um, but uh, it turns out in two dimensions, there are other possibilities. You can have other types of quantum particles. Um, it's allowed, but not, just because it's allowed doesn't mean that it's mandatory. And it turns out there are some situations within uh, two-dimensional uh, systems where that might be possible to create. Um, and so we're trying to find that. Uh, and this is a physics-type question rather than a chemistry-type question. Sometimes we have to do chemistry in order to do that. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, um, in the same way, sometimes we have to do welding, uh, and uh, <laughs> but yet, you know, I don't mostly keep the company of welders, uh, although not exclusively. So, do you tinker yeah. with stuff in your everyday life? Uh, somewhat, yeah. Uh, although these last couple of years building the lab has more or less kept me busy, so the the house is somewhat in disrepair. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and do you find sort of uh, what you do in the lab kind of frames your way of looking at the at the world when you're outside? Uh, very much so. Yeah, very much so. I think that the um, there's a, a good tradition in experimental physics of not, you know, taking for granted uh, what you can buy off a shelf uh, as being the only thing that can exist. And, and that uh, I sort of, uh, I like that approach to, let's say, at least our material world um, and, uh, and the divide between maybe commercial, you know, what happens to be commercially available and what's a uh, what's physically realizable, let's say. What are the big questions that remain in your field? Um, I would say, you know, there, there are many big questions and I could do a long laundry list, uh, but since I uh, get to choose, I'll choose the, you know, the one that I'm somewhat obsessed with now is whether this, uh, whether you can in fact make in the lab and, and use these particles that are not bosons and not fermions and, and the um, the and whether that can be something that one can harness for uh, to, to, to encode quantum information on long distances uh, so the um, the basic concept is that you know in an interacting system of electrons although not exclusively so there could be these collective, modes of electrons that essentially, you know, the, the, inf the quantum information in throughout the entire system is essentially encoded in the positions of these sort of little quanta of energy that are in the system. And this is an idea that goes back a long time. Uh, several previous winners of this prize are responsible, or the big breakthrough prize are responsible for that, uh, that concept. But whether this is something that's really realizable in the lab and whether 
you know, this huge body of theory that has almost taken this idea for granted as something that can actually be, be done in a robust way that with those sort of spectacular um, experimental outcomes uh, that have long been predicted, I would say that's sort of the big fish that I, mm -hmm. that, 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 that I spend my idle hours thinking about. Cool.